Greetings once again to my fellow Nords and Dunmer of Tamriel. It's Tapioks here, back from winter hibernation with my second video about the depth of field effect provided by E and B for Skyrim Special Edition. In this video, we will look at how to configure the effect to your liking, and we will also look at the alternative advanced depth of field effect by Marty McFly, including installation, configuration, and a bit about the tilt shift option. You may also be interested in my first video on ENB's depth of field effect, where we go over three simple but essential fixes for third person camera, blurry hands and weapons, and focal point precision. All right, let's get started. ENB depth of field configuration. The depth of field effect that comes with ENB for Skyrim Special Edition has a limited set of options, but it is fairly lightweight and easy to use. For demonstration purposes, we will be getting familiar with this wooden support beam here. Notice as the crosshair moves from the foreground beam to the background, the background scenery comes into focus while the beam in the foreground is rendered blurred and out of focus. And when the crosshair is positioned on the beam itself, this is rendered clearly, while the background elements are blurred according to their distance from the focal point. To configure the depth of field effect, as always we open our ENB interface with Shift Enter. In the ENB series.ini panel, ensure that Enable Depth of Field is selected, as shown here. Now, if we expand the Depth of Field section itself, we see two options. The Aperture Time parameter actually has no effect by default. It is just a variable that Boris makes available for other modders who may want to attach other behaviors to the Depth of Field shaders. Now, the Focusing Time parameter, on the other hand, specifies the time it takes for the Depth of Field effect to shift from one focal point to another. Higher values result in longer transition times, while a very low value produces a nearly instantaneous transition. If we set this to a value of 1, notice how the transition becomes very gradual when switching between focal points. For general gameplay, I recommend keeping this value somewhere between 0.2 and 0.5, so as to preserve smooth transitions while keeping them fast enough to respond to quick camera movements and gameplay. Now let's go ahead and close our ENB series and ENB series.ini panels and take a look over here in the shader parameters panel. In the ENB depth of field.effects section, make sure that example DOF is selected. If default is selected, then no depth of field effect will be used. Okay, now the first option listed here is focus sensitivity to nearest. We will take a closer look at this a bit later in the video, though in general you can keep this parameter at its default value of 0.5. Next up we have Aperture Size. This parameter determines how aggressively blur is applied to elements with increasing distance from the focal point. Lower values result in stronger blurring, whereas higher values cause the blurring to be applied more gradually with distance. Now the next option we have is DOF Sensor Size. As you can see from Boris's comment here on the enbdev.com forums, this parameter actually controls the same aspect of the effect as the Aperture Size parameter, though it functions in an inverse manner. This means that decreasing this value essentially has the same effect as increasing the Aperture Size value, though the scales of these values are different. In general, you can keep Aperture Size at a value of 1.0 or 2.0, and then just fine tune the effect using the DOF sensor size parameter. Moving along, the next parameter is DOF bokeh softness. ENB's default depth of field effect does in fact employ a bokeh technique, though this is not always obvious due to its implementation. Let's go ahead and drop this parameter to its minimum value of 0.1. Now, if we look at the foliage in the out of focus area of the screen, it becomes easier to see the distinctive polygonal shapes which characterize bokeh depth of field. However, using such a low value gives the depth of field a somewhat sharp and hard-edged aesthetic, which may not be desirable. I recommend setting this value to suit your own taste, though the default value of 0.5 is generally suitable for most people. And finally, we have the Bokeh Max Range parameter. This setting specifies the maximum allowed size for each polygonal bokeh element, and the maximum value allowed here is 2.0. All right, and now let's jump back and take another look at the sensitivity to nearest parameter, which we glossed over earlier. Again, referring to Boris's own forum post here, the sensitivity to nearest parameter modifies how the depth of field effect responds to very small objects that may be positioned very close to the camera, such as a chain link fence. 
This parameter determines whether the depth of field effect should focus on the fence itself or instead on what is being viewed through the fence. Now in Skyrim, we don't really find many chain link fences or other objects with similar properties. Furthermore, if you apply the focal point fix detailed in my previous video, the depth of field effect always focuses on the exact position of the crosshair, so this parameter has no impact. So, without the aforementioned focal point fix enabled, with this value set to zero, notice how the branch in the foreground remains out of focus, even though the crosshair is positioned on top of it. And now, setting this to a value of 1.0, notice how the branch is now in focus while the background elements are rendered out of focus. And there you have it, a few simple settings and you're ready to go. Things I like about the default ENB depth of field effect are the fact that it's simple to set up, it's fairly lightweight in terms of performance, and it also behaves nicely across most in-game scenarios. However, for those of you who like a few more bells and whistles in your effect toolbox, we can thank Marty McFly for providing his advanced depth of field effect, which can be used in place of the default effect. In this section, we will cover installation and configuration of Marty's depth of field, including a quick look at the tilt shift option it provides. To install Marty's advanced depth of field, first install ENB for Skyrim Special Edition as you normally would and then head over to this page on the enbdev.com forums. I'll leave a link in the video description. Here you can read up on the features of the effect, and you can also admire Marty's sexy forum avatar here. In the download area, you will want to click the link for the most recent version of the effect, here at the top of the list. Go ahead and download the file and save it somewhere on your computer. Then navigate to the downloaded zip file and extract its contents. In the extracted folder, Find the ENB depth of field.fx file and copy this to your clipboard. Next, we want to navigate to the game folder to install this file. You can get there easily through Steam by right clicking the game and selecting properties. Then on the local files tab, click the browse local files button. In the folder that opens, simply paste the file from your clipboard, overriding the default version of the file in the process. Okay, installation of Marty McFly's advanced depth of field is now complete. However, before we dive into configuration, there is also one fix I recommend implementing first. By default with Marty's depth of field, when changing focus from a nearby subject to a distant subject, the transition of the blurring effect takes place very abruptly. This is easy to see here with playback at half speed. Now, with the recommended fix in place, this transition from nearby to distant subjects takes place more smoothly, as shown here. I feel that the default behavior can be a little bit jarring, and I prefer the smoother behavior shown here. Though of course, opinions may vary. To implement this fix, first open the enb depth of field.fx file in a text editor, such as Notepad. Near the top of this file, find the line that refers to Autofocus Smoothing Enable, and change the zero on this line to a one, as shown here. Then simply save and close the file and you are good to go. All right, let's dive into configuration of Marty McFly's advanced depth of field. Back in the game, as always, we open our ENB menu with Shift Enter, and we will be focusing our attention on the depth of field.effects section of the shader parameters panel. For technique, make sure Marty McFly's ADOF is selected. Otherwise, you will have no depth of field effect enabled. The next option is for Enable Autofocus which automatically adjusts the effect's focal point based on the position of the crosshair. With this option disabled, the depth of field effect becomes static in nature, with the blurring effect increasing with distance regardless of the position of the crosshair. The manual focus depth parameter allows you to specify the distance at which subjects begin to render out of focus. Increasing this value increases the distance at which things start to appear blurry. Note that with autofocus enabled, this parameter has no effect. I generally prefer to play with autofocus enabled, but the manual option is there if you prefer it. The autofocus sample center X and center Y values determine the position of the screen that should serve as the focal point for the depth of field effect. The default values of 0.5 set this to the middle of the screen, where the crosshair is also positioned. So these default values should be suitable for most users. The autofocus sample count parameter determines the number of samples taken when calculating the focal point for the effect. Increasing this value can negatively impact performance, and a value of around 5 or so provides suitable results in my own testing. The autofocus sample radius parameter 
determines how large an area of the screen is sampled when calculating the focal point for the effect. Using larger values here causes the focal point to not precisely track with the position of the crosshair, instead sampling from a larger area around the crosshair. Note here how the background comes into focus before the cursor has completely moved off of the post in the foreground. And it also remains in focus until the crosshair is returned well into the position of the post. Using a small value like 0.1 or 0.2 allows the effect's focal point to track more precisely with the position of the crosshair. This is effectively the same as the focal point fix I recommended for ENB's default depth of field effect in my previous video. Next, let's take a look at the near blur curve parameter. For the sake of this demonstration, let's also increase the near depth molt value to 0.5 to make the changes easier to see. The near blur curve parameter determines how aggressively the blurring effect is applied to foreground elements when focusing into the distance. Notice as this value is increased, the blurring of foreground elements becomes more gradual moving into the distance. And with lower values, the blurring effect is applied with increased intensity over a distance. Now, one challenge I face with the near blur component of Marty's depth of field is that it is difficult to configure nicely for everyday usage. Even when using large values for near blur curve, I always end up with more foreground blur than I would prefer. Reducing the near blur molt value can help with this a bit, but it can prove tricky to find a workable balance. Even with a value as low as 0.1, foreground elements can still become more blurry than desired. As such, I generally effectively disable this feature by setting near blur molt to a value of 0.01. Now, the far blur curve parameter, on the other hand, is much easier to manage. Notice here as I reduce this value to 1, the blurring of background elements is applied with more intensity over distance. And as this value is increased, the blurring effect is applied more gradually over greater distance. I generally use a value of about 2.5 or 3.0 for this parameter. The far blur molt parameter affects the overall blurring intensity for distant subjects, and works along with the far blur curve parameter to determine how aggressively the blurring effect is applied. The next parameter, infinite depth distance, may sound a bit esoteric, but it's actually pretty straightforward in use. When looking at a nearby subject, the distant elements should only become out of focus as the viewer draws very close to the foreground subject. If this is set to a high value such as 1.0, notice how looking at this windmill causes the background to blur even though I am at a great distance from the windmill. This same background blurring also occurs as I move to look at this plant here. However, if we set this to a low value such as 0.015, notice how the entire scene remains in focus regardless of where I look. And then, only as the camera moves much closer to a foreground subject does the background begin to blur, as intended. Okay, the next parameter we have is bokeh intensity, which governs the intensity of the polygonal shapes used to construct the depth of field blur. At higher levels, the polygonal shapes are more easily distinguishable and respond more sensitively to bright elements of the image. Higher values also result in a slight overall brightening of blurred areas of the scene, as you can see here. The bokeh shape max size parameter determines the maximum possible size for the polygonal bokeh shape used for the effect. Note the larger hexagons here as the number is increased from 18 to 24. I'm going to jump down to the Gaussian post blur width here and lower this to 1.0. This reduces the overall amount of blur to help make the bokeh polygons a bit easier to distinguish. Now, jumping back up to a line I skipped, I'm going to click to enable bokeh shape preview window which brings up a preview of the currently defined bokeh shape in the bottom right corner here. This can be a very useful little tool, though you should know that just having this window open significantly impacts your performance, so it should not be used while playing the game or when optimizing your ENB configuration for performance. For me, the GPU load jumps all the way up from 72% to 92%. That being said, this tool allows you to easily see the impact of any changes you make. Notice how the preview shape changes instantly from a hexagon to a pentagon when the bokeh shape vertices value is lowered from 6 to 5. Using a lower value here helps with performance, as fewer samples or dots 
are required to generate the desired shape. Let's drop the post blur value all the way down to 0.1 here to make the pentagon shapes more easy to see in the game image. Now, looking at the bokeh shape quality parameter, notice how increasing this value increases the density of the dots used to construct the pentagon shape. As you may have guessed, using higher values here can also have a negative impact on performance. You only really need to increase the quality parameter when using a larger max size value, as otherwise the individual sample dots produce visible artifacts in the game, as shown here. The bokeh curvature parameter applies some rounding to the edges of the polygon, with higher values adding more curvature. At a value of 1.0, the polygon approximates a true circular shape. The bokeh shape rotation parameter controls the orientation of the polygonal shape, though in practice this has little impact on the perception of the effect, unless you just happen to have a favorite angle or something. The bokeh shape aspect ratio effectively controls the width of the bokeh shape. This feature may be helpful for ultra-wide monitors or multi-monitor setups, though unfortunately, I don't personally have the luxury of knowing. You can also see that the rotation parameter actually rotates the shape within this defined width, rather than simply rotating the entire shape around a central axis. The shape chroma amount parameter determines the intensity of chromatic aberration applied to the edges of the polygonal bokeh shape. Notice with higher values, there appears to be a bit of a rainbow effect on the shape's edges, where the red, blue, and green color channels are slightly offset from one another. The next setting here is Blur Render Res Molt. I believe this has to do with configuring the effect when downsampling from a higher resolution, though I'm not sure. In my own testing at a native 1080p, this parameter appears to have no appreciable impact on the depth of field effect. And finally, we have Gaussian Post Blur Width, which we saw a bit earlier, again, which is like a global blur width intensity multiplier for blur applied to out of focus subjects. Overall, Marty McFly's advanced depth of field provides a high quality and highly configurable depth of field effect. However, it can be more demanding on performance than the default depth of field that comes with ENB, and the near blur feature can be a bit tricky to configure for everyday use. But, in addition to improving the look of Skyrim's gameplay, by setting some parameters to more extreme values, Marty's effect can be used to craft some really creative and dramatic screenshots and videos, for those who may be so inclined. And in addition, Marty McFly's effect also offers a completely different focus mode for depth of field, known as Tilt Shift. To enable this feature, you must exit the game and once again open the ENB depth of field.effects file in a text editor. This time, near the top of the file, find the line referring to focus mode and change the zero on this line to a one, as shown here. And again, just save and close the file and you are ready to go. Now, when you boot up the game, you will notice that depth of field effect has a different nature to it. Specifically, only the top and bottom areas of the screen are ever rendered out of focus, while the horizontal center of the screen is always rendered clearly. This helps to give the image a sort of shoebox diorama feeling to it. When you open the ENB shader parameters panel, you will also notice a new set of options in the depth of field.effects section, pertaining to the tilt shift effect. Some of the options are the same as before, but some are new, such as the option to rotate the axis of the effect. Note here how the blurring is only applied to the bottom left and the top right areas of the image. There are a few other options in here to tweak things further, and if you are into this sort of thing, I recommend diving right in. Alright folks, I know it took me a while to get out this part 2 video for ENB's depth of field effect, though I should be able to pick up the pace with future videos moving forward. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll catch you next time.